Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to those of you who are already seated. Thank you to those of you who are joining us online. And I'm saying thank you to those who are coming in. It, it, isn't it always a wonderful day to, to come to the presence of the Lord? And today is beautiful. Oh my, it's just beautiful. We are so much into what I believe God is forming for us here in, uh, at New Beginnings. And those of you who are joining us, we are going to be doing a little bit um, different from what we used to do because this is going to be for 40 minutes. And after that, we will break into small groups and just fellowship and talk among ourselves. I'm believing that this is just the beginning of a new blessings for us. Um, I still want to mention to the church that our Bible study and our Sunday service, the way I see them, is that they are a package. On a day like this, we will dig, dig, uh, dig deep into the scriptures, and we will try to explain concepts and principles of the scriptures and, and dig deep into what the Lord s tells us so that we can be very equipped and we can defend what we believe and um, we can understand why we are living the way we do. But on Sundays, we are just going to be flowing in the spirit of the Lord. And what that means is this, there are times that God will just give one word and just that the word of the Lord will just move on with that and God will destroy yokes and break down barriers and just set us free. This is who we are. The New Beginnings Ministries is going to be with the, is the movement of the Holy Spirit, but the scripture will always be our guide. Let us pray. Father, we thank you because it is a blessed, wonderful day. We thank you for the sunshine. We believe that the word of the Lord is the true light that shines in the darkness of human hearts. Father, without the light, without Christ, we are depraved, we are lost, we are carnal. But when the word penetrates into the heart of a carnal, sinful creation, you transform it and you form it into the very likeness of Jesus Christ. And this is our prayers today, that as we want to look further into the scripture, we will hear directly from your throne, from you, Lord, and understand what you are telling us. Do this for the glory of your name, that your son may be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we are in James chapter 4, and today we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 10. As we get into chapter 4, James now begins to talk about the third aspect of what he calls evidence of true faith. In chapter 1, he had mentioned it very briefly, that true and authentic faith will be separate from the world. Now he's going to be very much digging deep into this and explaining very carefully that when we come to Christ, when we have adopted by the grace of God, are adopted by the Lord, he said that we are called out of the world and we should be separate from the world. So the title of today's study is Separation from the World. He's going to be talking about the believer's attitude to the world. And I believe now we understand that 
the notion of the world means the evil ways the world does its things. Now, James is not calling believers to live in the bush or to live some kinds of life that is completely um, detached from the material world. But rather, he is calling believers to become aware of the evil and the corruption in the world. He's warning believers against living a life that suggests that they are no different from the way that the world lives. Worldly desires, he warns, such as excessive desire for power, for pay and fame, for prestige, for possession. He said these are the main cause of divisions in the body of Jesus Christ. And he said you will find it in the church, in a church where you find division. He says that it does not originate from the hearts that desire spiritual growth. You will not find division in places where people want to be more like Jesus Christ. He said, rather, you will find it from rebellious hearts, which is conditioned on a person, a carnal mind's desires for things that will profit the self and that will only promote selfish pleasures. James calls the believers of the time to search their hearts as they attempt to understand the reason for conflict in their midst. He said, look very much deeply inwardly, and you will realize where it comes from. He said, you will understand that you are entangled because you seek fleshly, fleshly things, and you only want fulfillment of those things that do not glorify God. The solution, according to him, is that they will realize this problem, the, 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 the base, the source of this problem, and they will submit themselves under God's rule and find freedom in obedience to the word of God. If we come to this realization, we will find only one thing, deliverance, freedom, and we will find fulfillment because according to our creation, there is only one thing that can meet the depth of human craving. It is union with God. So he says, submit yourself under the word of God and you will realize that these conflicts will, will depart and you will find growth and fulfillment in your union with God. He's going to focus on three things. Usually I take about three subjects each time so that we can break it down enough time and then we'll move on. In verses one to 10, James will talk about the cost of worldly desires and you will see the way he portrays it. It is dangerous. It is costly. No believer really want to experience that. But that was the situation of the people here. The second thing is he's going to be talking about the consequences. If a child of God refuses to listen and become obedient and submissive to the word of God, but again entangles himself or herself in worldly matters, become very entangled in the evil systems of the world. There are consequences, and James will note that. And finally, he will talk about freedom, how one can be free and realize fully the call of God upon his or her life. Now I look at point one, the cost of worldly desires. James chapter four, I read from verse one. Where do all the fights and quarrels among you come from? They come from your desires for pleasure, which are constantly fighting within you. You want things, but you cannot have them. 
So you are ready to kill. You strongly desire things, but you cannot get them. So you quarrel and you fight. You do not have what you want because you do not ask God for it. And when you ask, you do not receive it because your motives are bad. You ask for things to use for your own pleasures. Now, I, I want you to just, just, real, just meditate on this. These are believers. These are people who knew the Lord. But listen to this writing. He said there is something that is constantly fighting within you. And that thing was so strong to the point, he said, you really, you are ready to kill. Does that, does that actually, does that picture tell us something about our, our experience in, in life? What is happening here? They are really ready to kill. And he said, the basis of these, you have strong desires. But he said, those desires are motivated <clears throat> by bad things. Number one, the source of their quarrels, according to James, is lust. There is lust within them, very impossible to control. What kind of lust is this? It is the lust for power. It is the lust for fame. And all of these things, the lust for money, sensual things, things that are completely what they were called out from. He said, you have ambition, but those ambitions, they are contrary to the ambitions of God for their lives. And they refuse to heed the warning of the wisdom of God. They seek their own ways, regardless of the knowledge that it is against the way of God. Now, there are times that we actually wonder, uh, and sometimes this has very much been very surprising to me. Um, we come together as God's children. There is a point that we are supposed to really look into. And God calls us to look into our lives and really explore deeply. What is the need of a person? And what is the need for our fellowship? And you will notice that some believers, they are so full of self that even in the face of the fact that, look, everything is just pointing to the fact that your position is only your selfish agenda. And you are so surprised that even in the face of every explanation, that we can just let the Lord be the Lord of his church that we can come to the understanding that we understand the cost of the price of the cross. We understand what Jesus Christ had done, even for the body of Christ. You wonder, some believers, they continue to make a stand for their own case, a kind of self, sense of self, and entitlement. This is what is going on here. And he said, individuals begin to seek their own ways. Then what happened? You begin to see cliques in the church. I belong to this group. I belong to this group. And then you notice this group is ready to kill even the other group. And the other group is ready to make sure that they set up strategies that will make sure that this other group does not progress. James says, you kill because of the strong desires. But again, he told them and said, there is a cost. And the cost is so deadly that they wouldn't want to experience it. What are the costs of 
living in this kind of way. Number one, said their prayers will not be answered. James chapter 4, verse 2, you want things, but you cannot have them. Selfishness, I tell you, my brothers and sisters, you will be completely surprised the way it stands against us and block our prayers. You know, there was a time that something happened in my life some years ago. Um, seriously speaking, I still believe, even as I preach today, that I was in the right because I felt that I've done everything to glorify God, and it hasn't gone my way. I have been so ill-treated. But then eventually, when it came to a point that I was really suffering, the Lord sent a child of God, a friend who was an elderly person to me, and said, God told me that you need to go back to these people who had actually treated you so badly because God has put them on, on you as your leader. Go to them and actually apologize and said you are sorry. When I received that message, I said, this is not God. How will God support oppression, abuse? I was abused. I was oppressed. I was... Every, you, I was hated. I, they, did, they did bad things to me. But when he left and I began to think, I was in a very dangerous situation. Then I said, okay, I'm going to go and I will do this. So I went to my boss and I apologized. I told him I come here today because the Lord sent me to you and asked me to come and apologize. And I said, but I am apologizing not because I wanted any gain from you. I come here not because I wanted a job. At that point, I was jobless. I said, but I come because the Lord wanted me to come to you and say, I am sorry because you were put on top, you were my leader. And then we settled and I left. The prayers that I had taken time to pray, Kate and I, for a long time, the Lord just opened the door. Selfishness, quarrel, can hinder our prayers. James said in 1, 6 to 8, that there are other things that can hinder faith, uh, prayers, faithlessness. He said, when you pray, you must believe and not doubt at all. But again, belief is not something that, God, I believe this one aspect of your word. Your word says, when I knock, when I seek, when I pray, I will find answers. But I don't believe in that other one that says, I must submit, I must live in respect, I must forgive. James says, Faithlessness in any aspect of our lives can hinder our prayer. Doubt will make us not to find answers to our prayers. Apart from that, he said, if you are going to receive anything from the Lord, God wanted a consistent living of the Christian character. We are called out of the world. We are called to abide in Christ. And in John chapter 15, verse 7, it says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you will ask for anything you wish, and you shall have it. Now, Jesus Christ does not play with words. He says everything that comes from the Lord, and the Bible told us that not a dot, not a dot, out of every scripture will go unfulfilled. So when the Lord says, if you ask anything, he means anything. But if we are going to understand that anything, it means anything within the will of God. It is not just I say, God, you know what? I just love the newest models of the best house in town. 
And I passed by the one that is so beautiful. And I said, Father, I claim it by faith. I'm not saying God cannot do it if that is the will of God. But again, there are times that we ask for things that are really meant for our own pleasures. And God may not want that for us at that time. The, set, the other thing he told us is that prayerlessness and lack of persistence will not actually help us to even grow. So there are times we pray, but we give God time. And we say, God, do it within this moment. If you don't, I'm gone. That is not what God calls us to. Isaiah chapter 51 verses 1 and 2 also tell us that don't think that the Lord is too weak to save you or too deaf to hear your call for help. It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. So sin also is a cost to God hearing us. What is the particular sin that James is concerned here? Involvement in things of the world. Now, he also made them to understand here that because of their strong desires for pleasures, because of their strong desire for things that are actually motivated by selfish gains, so they became sold unto uncontrollable lust. He said, you are ready to kill. I mean, sometimes you will be surprised at the kind of ways that Christians make money or the kind of businesses that they get into. And if any minister wants to preach, you better don't go into that boundary because you are going to offend. And if you are not careful, they will first of all tell you, this is a boundary you don't get into. And a minister who does not understand his or her calling will begin to compromise and allow things that God does not approve of to go on, and then the church will benefit from the profit, from ill gotten profit. And the whole thing become uncontrollable because they are now sold and they are entangled. The more it continues, the more they become enslaved. Unfortunately, it gets to a point that only God, only God can deliver. Corruption, if it is not quickly dealt with, particularly the way it is done in the world, it eats so deep, and if it gets into the church of Christ, the minister who is there is going to just die with it, or quickly you better run out. But I tell you, if this thing that James is talking about, he said they became so sold that they wanted to kill. They could kill for money. You better don't talk about that side. And they become so sold to the point that they tell you, it is our body, it is our life, it is our way of thinking. The world should not get into that place. Just allow us to come together and dance and celebrate, read the word, bless us, and that is all done. James said, this is worldliness. It kills and it does not demonstrate good life of faith. And he said, apart from that, it makes people to pray amiss. We lost focus in prayers. In that chapter 4, verse 2, he said, you do not have what you want because you do not ask God for it. And he said, even when you ask, you are praying for things that will fulfill your lusts rather than what will make you draw closer to God. So he wants them to reflect on it. What is the very uh, components of your prayer? What are you praying for? Money, house, cars, careers. What about praying for praise? What about praying for wisdom? What about praying for purity? What about praying for kindness, gentleness, peace? What about praying for a life that is sanctified, separate, separate, brought apart out of the world that we can shine the light. And unfortunately, he said, at the end, what it all does 
is degenerate spirituality, a kind of spiritual atmosphere that is cold, and even Satan can live in their midst, and he finds all pleasure. They call the name of God, but it doesn't move the enemy. It does not really does anything to the soul. James chapter 4, verse 3, when you ask, you do not receive. Your motives are bad. You ask for things to use for your own pleasure. Rather than growth, you will continue to degenerate. Worldliness kills. James tells them it does not help. Anyone can mention the name of the Lord, but if it does not really show that we are people who desire lifestyles after Jesus Christ, and our hearts are really ready to follow the Lord, and sinfulness, selfish desires is not dealt with, said the church will be cold, it will be prayerless, and it will live in frustration. There you will find quarrels. There you will find that people will just leave and it is just about me. The scripture told us in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 17, what I say is this. Let the Spirit direct your lives, and you will not satisfy the desires of the human nature. For what our human nature wants is opposed to what the Spirit wants, and what the Spirit wants is opposed to what our human nature wants. These two are enemies, and this means that you cannot do what you want to do. Do you see that strong terms? The, the flesh, the world, so entangles them, is that you cannot do what you want to do because there is that opposition. But if the Spirit leads you and you are submissive, then you are not subject to the law. James now moved to the second point, talking about the consequence of worldly desires. In chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, unfaithful people, he says, unfaithful people. This is writing to believers. Unfaithful people. What does this mean? I just want you to think about a kind of covenant that God has with Israel in the Old Testament. Because God always used this term for Israel, unfaithful, adulterous nation. It is within that covenant time that this is being used here, telling them you have a contract, you have a covenant, you have entered into relationship with Christ your Savior, but your life does not show faithfulness. Don't you know that to be the world's friend means to be God's enemy? Can you see that? The enemy of God people who are supposed to be God's children. If you want to be the world's friend, you make yourself God's enemy. Don't think that there is no truth in the scripture that says, the spirit that God placed in us is filled with fierce, fierce desires. But the grace that God gives is even stronger. As the scripture says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Unfaithfulness causes believers to be God's enemy. The spirit that God decide, that deposits inside of us craves for God. I tell you, you know it. You know it. The, 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 you see, God says this. He said that sinners are dead. They are dead in their trespasses. So, for example, if you, if you talk to a carnal, unregenerate person and say, are you a sinful person? Oh, well, they'll tell you, I'm not. Because their mind, their, their, their soul, their spirit is not awakened. But if you call a child of God who had come to the knowledge of salvation and you ask them before you come to Christ, before you found assurance and forgiveness of sin, were you a sinner? They will tell you. Because the Lord had opened their eyes to understand the condition of their sinfulness. They are awake. They are alive. But the Bible says 
that then the spirit of life, which is of God, that dwells inside of, God, uh, inside of them, begins to crave after God. And because of that craving, it calls them, it pulls them to live differently from the world. It pulls them to be striving more to be like Jesus Christ. The assurance within them that you are God's daughter, you are God's son. And they rejoice with the spirit of God that leads them and wanting them to actually understand the purpose of God for their lives, find meaning within that purpose. But when God's children do not follow those full steps, the Bible says they grieve the spirit. They cause God to be grieved. And the scripture says they become in enmity with God. Because at that point, they begin to yield more to the desires of the world and the desires of the flesh, which is contrary to that which the spirit wants. Psalm 73 verses 25 to 26 was written by Asaph. This was a guy who had duties within the temple as a musician. And look at what he wrote. He said, what else do I have in heaven but you? Since I have you, since I come to know you, what else could I want on earth? My mind and my body may grow weak, but God is my strength. He's all I ever need. That is the craving of the spirit that lives inside God's children. Now James was writing, it is the spirit that desires God so strongly. He said, do you think it is not the truth that the spirit that lives inside of you, he said, is so fierce, talking very much again that your God is a jealous God. He wants all of us. And he said, unfaithful living is arrogance against the spirit. Romans chapter 8 verses 7 to 8 says exactly it in this way. And so people become enemies of God when they are controlled by their human nature. For they do not obey God's law. And in fact, they cannot obey it. Those who obey their human nature cannot please God. Any life, any life that is given to sensual pleasures and allowed to be overpowered by worldly desires stands arrogantly against the desires of God's spirit. This is the fact about any of us who elevates self above God. If we elevate our ego beyond God, we fall into this particular description. We become arrogant. And it says we become proud and sinful in the sight of God. Whoever lives in this way is resisting God. James concludes. But then I love the way he's trying to put it to them here. He comes back again to tell and remind them about the grace of God. In Verse six, but the verse six, he said, but the grace that God gives is even stronger. As the scripture says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James says the strength of God that is available for us to overcome the world is stronger than the pull and allurement of the world. If only we will seek God honestly and humbly, then we will find strength for our daily living. James calls every one of us to humility, asking us to submit to God and be guided by the word of God. I want you to hear him. This man is writing from a very personal experience. Remember, he was the brother of Jesus Christ. Remember that he was making fun of Christ before Christ died. And you will understand the kind of life that just went into that. But he said, when the grace of God came right into me, that grace I know 
is stronger than the world. The grace of God is strong that it is sufficient for us to live the life that God wants us to live. And may I also remind you, this is not a call into a kind of legal, legal walk before the Lord. So it is not a call to say, you know what, I thank God because I am not a sinner. I don't run beyond the uh, traffic. Um, um, I don't, yeah, I don't get tickets. <laughs> so, Lord, I thank you. I am not like them. It's not saying that, you know what, I don't fall down on the street because I lost it and I see angels. <laughs> that is not what James is saying. It is not a legal kind of walk. The first thing James is reminding them is this, remember your relationship with your Lord. And when we understand that relationship, we begin to walk with the Lord as little children who desires nothing but the whole of Christ. And you grow with the Lord. Psalm 19 verse 105 reminds us and say, Your word is my lamp, and it guides me, and it is the light to my path. Can you see that kind of way it describes the growth? It said, The word of God is a lamp to guide me and a light for my path. So when we look into that kind of relationship, you realize the formation of our character, identity in Christ is through that word of God. Look at the promise of God again in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10. It says, do not be afraid. Don't be. The world is so strong and evil, but don't be afraid. I am with you. I am your God, and I will always let nothing terrify you I will make you strong, I will help you, and I will protect, and I will save you. The final thing that James wanted them to understand is there is freedom from worldly desires. So, so then submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will run away from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you hypocrites. Be sorrowful, cry and weep. Change your laughter into crying your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. What are the steps that were stated here by James? Number one, submit to God. Number two, resist the devil. So when you do that, he will run away from you. Resist the devil. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 talks about Jesus Christ. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. That Christ lives inside of us. He said, draw near to God. Cleanse your actions. Purify your thoughts. Purify your thoughts. Let the word of God be that which begins to form your thoughts, my thoughts. And he said, confess your sins, be sorrowful, cry, weep, confess before the Lord. And we have this assurance in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to 9. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and there is no truth in us. But if we confess our sins to God, he will keep his promise and do what is right. He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all wrongdoing. Repent finally and turn away from sin. He said repentance comes from a humble heart. In verse 10, humble yourself before the Lord and God will lift you up. Isn't that beautiful. I love the Christian faith. And the reason simply is because Christ really showed us 
what it means to be a child in the kingdom. And that's the way he wants us to live. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you because you called us to relationship. And so when you said you are mad, when we just get entangled in the world, we know it's coming from a heart that is full of love. Lord, we pray that you will teach us. But your grace, you said, is sufficient for us. Let this grace begin, Lord, to mold us. Let the Spirit of God, the fire from the altar, the love of Jesus Christ, let it begin to form us. Father, let the world become the things that we just hate. Not the people of the world, but every evil system of the world that we will say no, but we will say yes to you. And through this way of life, we will be able to win many to your side in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer to our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you to those of you online. We are now going to say we'll see you on Sunday, and God bless you. Now, can I ask us to form like